In this video, we'll look at some cases that involve clues that were written at the crime scene or sent to the police. One case we'll discuss is one of the most famous criminal cases in modern French history. This is the sixth video in our series about strange written clues. If you haven't watched the other five, please check them out afterwards. The links are in the description box. Number 3. John Terrace Brooks is a small city in Alberta, Canada. It is located about 116 miles from Calgary. In 2009, the population of the city was about 13,000 people. 26-year-old John Terrace lived in a small house on a quiet street in Brooks. On the evening of November 12, 2009, Paris went to his parents' home to do laundry. They also lived in Brooks. But shortly after he started doing his laundry, he had to return home unexpectedly. It's believed that 26-year-old John Terrace encountered at least two men in his home. One of the men was armed with a handgun. Terrace had a set of samurai swords and he managed to grab one of them. There was a struggle, and Terrace was slashed on the arm with a sword, and he was shot. It's also believed that Terrace managed to stab one of his attackers with the sword. After Terrace was shot, he managed to call 911, and first responders raced to his home. When they got there, they found that the attackers were gone, and Terrace was bleeding to death. He was airlifted to a hospital in Calgary. But sadly, 26-year-old John Terrace died a short time later. The police were able to talk to Terrace before he died, but he did not give them too much useful information. He did say that two men had attacked him. One was a white, tall man who was heavyset. He was the shooter. The other man was tall, thin, and of Asian descent. He was the one who was stabbed. It's believed that the man traveled nearly 200 miles to a hospital in Red Deer, Alberta and got medical treatment for a stab wound. The police were unable to identify the man who was stabbed. The police looked around Terrace's home and noticed that only one thing was missing. It was the samurai sword that Terrace used to defend himself. The samurai sword possibly had dragon graphics on the handle and the blade. About two weeks after the murder, the police received an anonymous phone call. The caller talked about the murder, but they did not reveal the identities of the killers. The police believe that the call came from Calgary. Terrace had once lived in Calgary, and he would often drive two hours to the city. 
Then the police received this anonymous note in the mail. It was on a piece of paper with the letterhead of a business called Grandma's Attic Home Parties Incorporated. Grandma's Attic Home Parties was a home party planning business that was located in an industrial area of Calgary. The note says, with Terrace, it was self-defense, case closed. The writer misspelled Terrace's last name, leaving out one of the R's. The postmark indicated that the note was mailed from Calgary. The police and Terrace's family are hoping that someone will recognize the handwriting and contact the authorities. The police think that John Terrace's murder was premeditated. They also said that there may be information in the community that suggests that the murder may be connected to the drug trade. But they would neither confirm nor deny that Terrace's murder was drug related. Terrace's family thinks that his killers were watching his home. When he left to go do laundry, they broke in and they were planning on stealing something. But then he surprised them when he returned home early. There was a struggle and Tara stabbed one of his attackers. They got the sword away from him and then slashed him on the arm with it and then shot him. This theory goes along with the message on the note that the police received. When Terrace returned home, he may have acted aggressively to the men he found inside his home. The killers may have felt like they were defending themselves. The police think that John Terrace's murder is solvable. But unfortunately, after nearly 11 years, there have been no breaks in the case. The police and Terrace's family think that one of the best leads could come from identifying the author of the note. Or they hope that someone with information about the murder or the killers will come forward. John Terrace's family knows that solving the murder won't bring him back, but it might give them some closure. Number 2. Christine and Ronald Jabali Sr. New Baltimore, Michigan is a city in the Detroit metropolitan area. It was home to Christine and Ronald Jabali Sr. In 2006, the Jabalis, who were both 58, celebrated their 39th wedding anniversary. The couple had two sons, a daughter, and nine grandchildren. Ronald Jabali Sr. was a self-made man. He never attended college. Instead, he worked as a truck driver. But he eventually became the top salesperson for a wholesale food business. Christine had been a homemaker and she raised the couple's three children. In 1998, Ronald Sr. took out a mortgage on their home and he invested the money in a butcher shop in Detroit's Eastern Market. The shop, called RJ Meat Shop, was managed by Ronald Sr.'s two sons, Ronald Jr. and Ryan. Ryan, the youngest of the Jabali children, worked at the front counter, and Ronald Jr., the eldest, was the manager. Ronald Sr. would work at the butcher shop on Saturdays when he was free. Christine and the Jabali's only daughter, Nicole, would also work at the shop part-time. In the second week of October 2006, Ronald Sr. and Christine were supposed to go on vacation in Ireland. It was going to be their first vacation abroad. On the evening of October 6, 2006, Ronald Sr. and Christine were at home. Ronald Sr.'s best friend was over and they were in the garage. Just before 8 p.m., Christine yelled out to Ronald Sr. that the pizza she made for dinner was ready. Ronald Sr.'s friend laughed and drove home. The next morning, Ronald Jr. and Ryan arrived at the butcher shop and they were surprised to find that their father wasn't already there. They thought that this was unusual because their father was incredibly punctual. 
That morning, Ryan called his parents several times, but no one answered the phone. Ryan then called his girlfriend, who didn't live far from his parents' home, and he asked her to go check on them. She drove over to their home. In the garage, she found their dead bodies in congealed pools of blood. Their deaths had been brutal. They had been struck on the head seven to nine times with an unknown object. Both had been stabbed over a dozen times and their throats were slit. The murder weapons have never been found. There were no signs of a break-in or forced entry. Nothing of value appeared to have been stolen. Only two knives from the kitchen were missing. The police think that these were the murder weapons. Ronald Sr. still had his wallet on him. Christine was still wearing her jewelry and her purse, which had cash in it, was still in the house. Besides the dead bodies in the garage, nothing appeared to be amiss in the home. The police determined that the couple was killed the night before their bodies were found. Leftover pizza was found on the stove. Ron Sr. and Christine were very neat people and they would have never left food out overnight. Also, blood was found on the driveway and there was frost on the blood. Based on evidence found at the Jabali home, the police suspected that they were killed by someone they knew. They theorized that Ronald Sr. was talking to the killer before the attack started in the garage. He tried to escape at the garage door, but the killer caught him and dragged him back into the garage. A partially eaten cookie and a pair of slippers were found on the steps leading from the garage to the house. The police believe that Christy casually walked into the garage and she saw her husband being attacked. She dropped the cookie and started to run, losing the slippers in the process. She was also struck in the head with the unknown weapon which dazed her, or possibly she lost consciousness. While the couple was incapacitated, the killer got the two knives from the kitchen and then stabbed and slashed Ronald Sr. and Christine. The garage had been wiped down and mopped, so the police did not find much forensic evidence. The police thought that the most promising piece of evidence was found under the couple's jeep that was parked in the garage. It appeared to be a message written in blood. It's believed that Christine wrote it because it was her blood. The police assumed it was a clue to the identity of the killer. The problem was that the police had no idea what the message meant. It appeared that when the killer mopped up the crime scene, he partially erased some of the letters in the message. The police thought that at least one letter was erased. According to the newspaper, the Macomb Daily, the letters that remained appeared to be S, C, E, E, J, and then the last letter is either G or a D but there is no consensus on if those are the correct letters. Other people see different letters. Amateur sleuths have tried to determine what the message said. Some people thought that it said Nicole, which is the name of the Jabali's daughter. Other people think it says JJ, which stands for Jabali Jr. or Junior Jabali, which would be Ronald Jr. A detective who worked on the case thought it said Sun Jr., which again implicated Ronald Jr. Besides what they thought was written in blood, the police suspected that Ronald Jr. might have been the killer for several reasons. On the day the bodies were found, Ronald Jr. kept the butcher shop open all day and closed it at its regular time. At the end of the day, he told the workers that his parents had been murdered. One of those workers was his sister, Nicole. He called her into his office at the end of the workday and informed her then. 
After Ronald Jr. closed the shop for the day, he did not head home directly. Instead, he went to a house he was remodeling. The home was nearly done and it had running water and electricity. The police thought it was odd that Ronald Jr. would go to that house instead of going straight home. Ronald Jr. was married with four children, so shouldn't he have gone home and told them about the murders? Ronald Jr. was questioned about this, and he initially told the police he went to check on the house to make sure it had been broken into. But when he was interviewed months later, he had a different story. Ronald Jr. admitted that he was addicted to the painkiller, Vicodin. Ronald Jr. said that he went to the home he was remodeling because he wanted to hide the Vicodin pills he had on him. He thought that if the police searched him and found the pills, they would be suspicious of him. The police thought that this story was very odd. If he wanted to get rid of the pills, why did he just throw them out the window while he was driving? Or why did he flush them down the toilet at the butcher shop? The police thought that Ronald Jr. killed his parents and then hid the murder weapons and his bloody clothes in the home that was being remodeled. He then went to the home the next day to permanently dispose the evidence. Ronald Jr. also made unusual comments to two of his uncles. Eight days after the murders, Ronald Jr. said to his uncles that he might have killed his parents and just didn't remember. He said he might have done it while sleepwalking. While the police had their suspicions about Ronald Jr., they had no evidence that he was the killer. Notably, it was clear that Ronald Sr. and Christine put up a fight when they were murdered. But Ronald Jr. had no marks on him. The police also had never found the murder weapon nor had they found any evidence that placed Ronald Jr. in his parents' home on the night of the murders. The police also have never found the murder weapons. Ronald Jr. had taken three polygraph exams. The first two times, the results were inconclusive. The last time, he failed. But this was not evidence that he had killed his parents. Over two and a half years went by and no arrests were made. Then Ronald Sr.'s best friend, who was at their home on the night of the murders, reviewed a videotape of the crime scene. He noticed that something was missing from the garage. It was a five pound steel doorstop that looked like a fire poker. The friend knew the doorstop well because he was the one who had made it. He created a replica of the doorstop and he gave it to the police. The medical examiner determined that the doorstop was most likely the bludgeoning weapon. Even though the police had no physical evidence, 40-year-old Ronald Jabali Jr. was arrested on June 26, 2010, nearly three years after the murders. Ronald Jabali Jr. went to trial in October 2011. The district attorney painted a picture of what they thought happened on the night of the murders. According to their theory, Ronald Jr. stopped by his parents' home and he was talking to his father in the garage. His mother was on the couch in the living room reading a book and eating a cookie. Around 8.15 p.m., something happened and Ronald Jr. snapped. He grabbed the doorstop and he started beating his father with it. The noise attracted the attention of his mother. So she came out to the garage. When she saw her son beating his father, she dropped the cookie she was eating and ran at her son, losing her slippers in the process. He then beat her with the doorstop. While his parents were immobilized, Ronald Jr. grabbed the knives and then finished off his parents. He then went to the home he was remodeling where he washed up and changed his clothes. Once he had cleaned himself up, he went home. Later that night, 
He snuck out of his family's home and he went to his parents' house. He wiped down and mopped the garage. The next day, after working all day, Ronald Jr. went back to the home he was remodeling and collected the murder weapons and the bloody clothes. He then disposed of all the evidence. Two of Ronald Jr.'s uncles testified and they said that eight days after the murders, Ronald Jr. said that he might have killed his parents and just didn't remember the murders. One uncle also said that Ronald Jr. had threatened him because he was going to testify against him at the grand jury. His uncle was so nervous that he even got police protection. The defense argued that there was no physical evidence that showed that Ronald Jr. killed his parents. A recording of one of Ronald Jr.'s interviews with the police was played. Ronald Jr. explained that he made the statements to his uncles because he felt guilty that his parents had been killed and he couldn't have done anything to stop it. He had also denied committing the murders dozens of times. Another problem for the district attorney was that they didn't have a clear motive. Their main theory was that Ronald Jr. killed his parents over a financial dispute. They said that Ronald Jr. could have possibly been doing something with the butcher shop's finances. But there was no evidence that Ronald Jr. had done anything improper with the finances. Ronald Jr.'s wife testified. She said that she returned home on the night of the murders at around 8.30. She remembered the time specifically because her sister was visiting and she had left just before 8.30 and then her husband arrived home. According to the district attorney's timeline, the Jabalis were killed sometime between 8.15 and 8.20. Then Royal Jr. went to the home he was remodeling, washed up, and then he went home. But if Royal Jr. was home by 8.30, he would not have had time to do all that. Ronald Jr.'s wife also testified that he had no bruises, marks, or scratches on him, and he wasn't acting unusual. She said that he stayed home all evening, and he went to bed around 10.30. He did not get up and leave the house until the next morning. Ronald Jabali Jr.'s trial for first-degree murder lasted for six days. The jury deliberated for just an hour, they found Ronald Jr. not guilty on all counts. Despite the verdict, the district attorney's office and the new Baltimore Police Department believe that Ronald Jr. is the killer and they consider the case closed. Ronald Jr. and many people in his family, including his siblings, believe that he is innocent. They have tried to get the new Baltimore Police Department to reopen the case so that they can find the killer. In October 2012, on the 6th anniversary of the murders, Ronald Jr. offered a $10,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. The Jabley family said that they think the writing of the blood may be a clue. But regardless, they hope that someone with intimate knowledge of the murders will come forward and help solve the case. Number 1. Gislin Marshall In 1991, Chislan Marshall was 65 years old. Marshall was the daughter of an industrialist. She got married for the first time when she was 16. The marriage produced a son, but she and her husband later got divorced. Marshall's sister ended up raising her son. Marshall's second husband was an industrialist who made his fortune for manufacturing headlights. The marriage did not produce a child. Marshall's husband died in 1982 and she inherited his wealth. In 1991, Marshall was splitting her time between Switzerland and Mouget, France. Mouget is a commune on the French Riviera and is just north of Cannes. Marshall lived in an upscale villa in the commune. 
On the morning of June 23, 1991, Marcel called her friend, Francine Pascal. They arranged to meet for lunch the next day. Then Marcel said she had to go because she was going over to a friend's home for lunch. Marcel never arrived at her friend's home for lunch. The next day, when Marcel didn't show up for her lunch meeting with her friend, Francie Pascal, Pascal tried to call her several times. But her calls went unanswered. So Pascal went over to Marcel's home. She found nothing out of sorts, and there was no obvious signs that something was wrong. There was no evidence of a break-in or forced entry. When Pascal couldn't find Marcel, she called the gendarmerie, which are French soldiers that work as police officers. Gendarmes went to her villa, and they searched for her. At around 5 p.m., they went into the basement. In the basement, there was a boiler room, and the door was shut. They tried to open the door, but it wouldn't budge. It took two of them to force the door open. It turned out that a folding bed and a metal bar were blocking the door. The metal bar was resting on a piece of lumber, and one end of the bar was jammed under the crack of the door. In the windowless boiler room, they found the dead body of 65-year-old Ghislaine Marshall. She had been stabbed 13 times. She had also been struck in the head five times with a piece of lumber that was under the piece of metal that was jammed under the door. It's believed that the weapon used to stab her was a five-inch hunting knife. The knife has never been found. On the back of the door of the boiler room, written in blood, was Omar Mati. It appeared that Marcel, or possibly her killer, tried to write a message, but didn't finish it. The gendarmes searched the basement, and on the back of the basement door, written in blood, was the message, Omar Ma 2A. This roughly translates to, Omar kill me. Because of the messages, the gendarmes immediately had a suspect, Omar Radad. For the past two years, Radad had worked as Marcel's gardener. Omar Radad was arrested the next morning as in-law's home in Toulon. Radad was a Moroccan immigrant who was illiterate and he had a poor command of the French language. When Radad was interviewed by the gendarmes, he was not provided with a translator. So he responded yes to a lot of questions, even though he didn't understand them. Radad was asked if he visited prostitutes, and he said yes. Radad also said that yes, he liked to go to the casino. So the police thought that Radad got into an argument about money with Marcel, and then he killed her. He then stole some money from her purse. While Radad said yes to a lot of questions, he did not admit to killing Marcel. He also denied being at Marcel's home on the day she was killed. Omar Radad didn't have a strong alibi for the time of the murder. It's believed that Ghislaine Marcel was killed sometime between noon and 2 o'clock on Sunday, June 23rd. Usually, Radad didn't work on Sundays. But on June 24th, Radad, who was Muslim, planned on going to his in-law's home in Toulon to celebrate Eid. To get the Monday off, he worked on Sunday, June 23rd, at the home of Francine Pascal. He worked there all morning, and then, at about noon, he stopped working to take a lunch break. Pascal lived a short distance away from Marcel, and Radag could have made it to Marcel's villa in a minute and a half on his moped. But Radag said he didn't go to Marcel's home. Instead, he drove his moped to a nearby bakery, where he bought half a baguette. He then went home, and he passed a neighbor as he walked to his apartment. Radad ate his lunch at home alone while he watched a quiz show on television. He left his home on his moped at about 1240. 
At 12.45, he stopped at a phone booth and called his wife at her parents' home. Radad then returned to Pascal's home and worked the rest of the afternoon. Pascal said that Radad was wearing the same clothes that he was wearing that morning. The next morning, at 7 o'clock, Radad boarded a train to Toulon. But there were problems with Radad's alibi. Neither woman who was working at the bakery remembered Radad coming in that afternoon. But they did sell over 500 baguettes that day. Radad's neighbor was interviewed, and he also didn't remember seeing Radad that day. Omar Radad was subsequently charged with murder. There were a lot of problems with the case against him. After Radad was arrested, no marks were found on him. If he attacked Marshall, he probably would have had some scratches or bruises on him. The gendarmes collected the clothes that Radad was wearing on the day of the murder, and they did not find any blood or forensic evidence on them. Shortly after the body was found, Francine Pascal received a phone call from an anonymous caller. The caller said that Omar Radad would probably be arrested soon. What was unusual about the call was that the news of the murder had not been made public yet. This suggests that the caller knew intimate details about the crime scene because they were there. The call was never investigated. The most significant problems with the case were with the crime scene. Radon's fingerprints were not found in the basement. Also, the medical examiner said that based on the wounds, the killer was most likely left-handed. Radon was right-handed and he had mobility problems with his right arm. He had undergone surgery on his right elbow because of an accident. So would he have been able to attack Marshall with two weapons? The Jadarm were also confused about how the door became blocked from the inside. The folding bed, which weighed 25 pounds, was jammed between the door and the wall. Then a metal bar was resting on a piece of lumber, and the bar was jammed under the crack of the door. The boiler room had no windows and only one door. How did the killer manage to block the door from the inside and then get out of the boiler room? One theory is that the bed and the bar were resting up against the wall on the opposite side of the door. When the killer left, the closing of the door caused the items to fall. Or the killer rested the items against the door and then they fell into place when the door closed. Another possibility is that Marcel barricaded herself in the room. But this presents a host of different problems that we'll discuss in a few minutes. What people find most troubling about the crime scene is that the only clues that implicated Radad were the two messages written in blood. If his name had not been written in the victim's blood, Radad probably wouldn't have been arrested because nothing else connected him to the crime scene. There are three possibilities as to who wrote the messages, Shazam Marshall, Omar Radad, or someone else wrote it to frame Radad. Let's explore the first theory that Marshall wrote it as she lay dying. Would she have been able to write a message on the basement door and then get into the boiler room and write the second message? If she could move, why did she go into the boiler room instead of getting out of the basement? Even if she couldn't get up the stairs, couldn't she have gone to the base of the stairs and started yelling for help? Also, no fingerprints were found in the blood. Wouldn't Marcel have used her fingertips to write the messages? If she wrote them, she most likely would have left one fingerprint in the blood. The gendarmerie's theory is that Marcel was attacked and she wrote the message on the basement door. Then, for some reason, she made her way to the boiler room, started to write the second message, but she didn't finish it. She had either become too weak to finish it, or she stopped writing for some other reason. 
One theory is that she heard the killer come back into the basement, so she stopped writing and barricaded herself in the room to shield herself from further attack. But this idea doesn't make a lot of sense. If Marshall was able to write the message, she was probably left alone in the basement. It's not likely that the killer would have attacked her and then watched her write the message. Why would Marcel take the time and energy to write a message that she had been killed instead of trying to get out of the basement so that she could get help? If she were conscious, she would have realized that she was in dire need of medical help. On a basic survival instinct level, wouldn't she have tried to get help instead of writing a message on the back of the door and then going into the boiler room, which had no other way out, and try and write the same message? One explanation is that because of her attack, she wasn't physically able to get out of the basement. But if she wasn't physically able to get out of the basement, would she have been physically able to write the message on the door, then get into another room, start to write the message on that door, and then use the bed and the bar to barricade herself in the room? As we mentioned before, one possibility is that the killer came back into the basement after the attack and she got into the boiler room to get away from him. Marshall probably would have only barricaded herself in the boiler room if she knew the killer came back into the basement. When humans are badly wounded, their instinct isn't to hide. If Marshall thought she was already dying, enough to write that she had been killed in her own blood, wouldn't it have been better for her to risk being found in the main part of the basement instead of barricading herself in the boiler room? Besides shielding herself from further attack, there was no benefit to barricading herself in the boiler room. Barricading herself in the boiler room would have meant certain death because help would not have been able to get to her. Another problem with the idea that Marshall barricaded herself in the room was that she had been struck five times in the head with a piece of lumber and stabbed 13 times. Would she have been able to escape her killer and get into the boiler room without him catching her first? Also, it's assumed that she would have dragged herself or crawled into the boiler room. But there were no blood stains that indicated that this happened. Instead, the blood drops seemed to indicate that the killer carried her into the boiler room. Another problem is the phrasing of the message on the back of the basement door. If Marcel wrote it, that she was clearly alive when she did it. Why would she write she had been killed when she was still alive? Why not just write Omar's name and leave it at that? Or why not write something like, Omar attacked me? Another problem is the words that she used. The scroll said Omar Matue, which is grammatically incorrect. The correct way of writing it is on the screen now. Both sentences are pronounced the same way, but the way it was written on the back of the door is grammatically incorrect. The writer used the infinitive form of the verb kill instead of the past participle, killed. In French, the spelling of a verb can change depending on if the subject of the sentence is male or female. In the sentence, Omar Matue, the verb, kill, is 2A. Since just saying Marcel was female, 2A should have been spelled T-U-E with an accent and then another E. If Marcel had been a male, the word 2A would have been spelled this way, with only one E. Marcel was a highly educated French woman and she often did crosswords. Many people do not think she would have made this mistake. One possible explanation is that Marcel had been beaten in the head and she was losing blood, so she probably wasn't thinking clearly. What else is interesting is that the mistake is only apparent when it's written out. When it's spoken, the infinitive, masculine, and feminine versions of the spelling of the verb kill are pronounced the same way, 2A. So this would have been an easy mistake for someone to make whose first language isn't French. This brings us to the second option as to who wrote the message, Omar Radad. 
Radan's first language was not French. But the problem is, is that Radan was illiterate and he could only write and read his own name. Also, why would he write his own name to implicate himself? This leads to the third option, which is that someone else wrote the message to frame Omar Radad. They would have had a reason to hide their fingerprints, which would explain why there weren't any fingerprints found in the blood. If the killer's first language wasn't French, it would also explain the grammatical mistake. Finally, if it was written to frame Radad, it clearly worked because he was arrested and charged with the murder. After Radad was charged with murder, he was held in jail while he awaited his trial. He maintained that he was innocent. He even went on two hunger strikes to protest his arrest. One hunger strike lasted for 36 days. Omar Radad's trial started on January 24, 1994. It lasted for about a week. Besides his name being written in blood at the crime scene, no other physical evidence connected him to the crime. The defense was also able to decredit the theory regarding motive. It was thought that Radak killed Marshall because they had gotten into an argument over money. He wanted in advance and she refused to give it to him. It was thought that some money was stolen from Marshall's purse but this has never been proven. Also, nothing had been stolen from Marcel's home and she was still wearing her jewelry. If her dad was so hard up for money, wouldn't he have stolen some items? Other people who employed Radad said that he was never greedy. One man who employed Radad said the biggest problem was getting him to take his entire pay. He also said that if Radad needed money, he would have been happy to give him a loan because he respected Radad and he thought he was a hard worker. The gendarmerie theorized that Radad was deeply in debt because he gambled and frequented prostitutes. But the evidence showed that Radad's financial situation was not dire enough to murder someone. The gendarmes interviewed many sex workers and none of them had ever met Radad. All the evidence, including the witness statements, indicated that Radad was just a hard-working family man. Omar Radad's trial lasted for about a week. The jury deliberated for six and a half hours. He was found guilty and he was sentenced to 18 years in prison. Many people were outraged by the verdict. In May 1996, at the request of the King of Morocco, French President Jacques Chirac granted Omar Radad a partial pardon. He reduced Radad's sentence to four years and eight months, allowing him to be paroled at any time. Radad was paroled two years later in September 1998. Since Radad's release, more investigation has been done into the murder. Several handwriting experts compared the handwriting of the bloody messages to Marcel's handwriting on crosswords she completed. The experts said that she most likely did not write the bloody messages. In 2001, DNA testing was done on the blood found at the crime scene. Blood from a male was found mixed with Marcel's blood. The male's blood was not Omar Radad's. No match to the male DNA has ever been found. Despite all this, in the autumn of 2002, the court, a review and reconsideration, confirmed that Omar Radad killed Ghislaine Marshall and they would not grant Radad a new trial. Omar Radad has always proclaimed his innocence. The murder of Ghislaine Marshall or the Omar Radad affair is one of the most famous criminal cases in modern France. It has been the subject of several books, documentaries, and a movie. Many people believe that Omar Radad is innocent and the real killer got away with murder. 
Thank you so much for watching this video. If you found it interesting, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos just like it. Also, if you are looking for something new to watch, why not check out my new channel, Chapter Dark. The videos are mysteries that you can try and solve. Do you have what it takes to solve these mysteries? You can find a link to Chapter Dark in the description box below. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.